So fire drill, you know, today I'm reckoning suddenly you have a bunch of traffic on your site. How do you deal with it? How do you prepare for it? Um, we'll go over all these things and hopefully you guys will learn how to be ready. Uh, so my name is Matthew Rear, I'm a senior developer at Digital Bridge Solutions. This is Madison Major, he's our client services director. Um, my arguable username is on the bottom, mine is Crash with an X. I'm cool. This is Madison Major because he was boring. Um, <laughs> and so today I am going to be a firefighter. And you may recognize him better with a beard. Um, <laughs> all right. So, so, yeah, so just a little bit about us. So, Digital Bridge Solutions, we're uh, obviously a Drupal development shop, which is why we're here with all of you great people. Um, but we specialize mostly in e-commerce and highly transactional websites. Um, so really kind of the purpose of our business is using uh, Drupal, Magento, and other open source uh, systems to support e-commerce sites and to work with uh, manufacturers and uh, businesses selling to other businesses in the Chicagoland area um, with the goal of really growing their e-commerce and growing their online revenue. So. Day one, I'm going to talk about the first time I ever dealt with performance problems. I walked in during the holiday season and I got this message on one of our sites. It says, you have too many connections in our SQL layer. So what do you do in this situation? Do you spin a new SQL server? Do you change the connection limit? Um, do you reboot everything and hope it all works? Or do you do something else? What do you guys think? Who thinks you spin a new server? How about uh, changing the connection with it? Uh, reboot everything, hope it works, something else, who knows? So, a lot of people have no idea. Yeah, so I have no idea. idea. So you're about to learn. What I did was I changed the connection limit. And if you did that also, congratulations. Your site is now offline for two hours. We can make a total So that was a great first day for me. Um, really learned a lot that day. What we're really going to talk about is that you need to understand what's going on in your system to tweak anything. I kind of blindly updated the setting based off of the message and had a pretty awful result. Um, so yeah, just a little bit on kind of why you should listen to us and why we're experts in this field. So as I said a little bit earlier, we work mostly with e-commerce sites. And I know a lot of people here do some e-commerce, but maybe primarily content. Um, for those who aren't familiar, you know, e-commerce can't get all the advantages, or it's kind of a little tougher to get all the advantages of caching that you can with the content site. So performance becomes a little bit more tricky when, it, uh, when you're really focusing on a lot of authenticated users. Um, secondly, we deal with large amounts of scale. So we have some clients and brands that are very well known and their sites can go from 60 concurrent users on an average day and ramp up to 10,000 concurrent users on a busy day. Um, they don't necessarily have all the budget and resources to support that type of load any day of the week. Um, so it's re really important for us to have a, a method to bring them up to that size of scale uh, very quickly. So the purpose of this talk really is to avoid the situation that I just talked about. Do not do what I did on the first day. Um, so we're really going to nail a few things home during this talk. Um, and really what this talk is oriented towards is people who support YouTube sized businesses that may drive larger amounts of traffic at times. So it's not really geared towards large organizations that have a dedicated to. But if you're a small team supporting a medium-sized business, the stock should be pretty helpful. Um, we're also going to show that you really need to understand what's going on within your infrastructure. And I'm going to keep saying you have to have an intimate relationship with your entire environment, with your application, with all parts of the system to really be able to support a system at low if you're a small team. <laughs> And we're going to show you that performance is an ongoing problem and concern that you have to test often and be aware of during every change to your website. Yeah, and just to, to back up what Matt said on the on our concept of environmental intimacy, um, you know, everyone who's who's a developer in the room probably knows how your site works, knows how it's built. 
but knowing how it's built versus how it runs under uh, crazy amounts of load that it wasn't necessarily designed for are two completely different things because you can see behaviors that you would have never expected. So knowing not only the ins and outs of how it was constructed, but also how it behaves is going to be extremely uh, important for this talk. So some other things that we'll be covering today. So in general, we'll talk a little bit about e-commerce, but hey, this stuff doesn't only apply to e-commerce. This is very important for content as well. Any of the ideas that we bring up uh, that are commerce related uh, can apply to sites and applications of all types. Um, we'll cover how to create a performance plan uh, and the importance of that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about tools that we've identified over the last few years that have been extremely helpful to us in making this process uh, much faster and much smoother. Um, what, and not only what, but also when uh, to test your site for performance and for um, scale and load. Secondly, analyzing the results of the outcomes of those tests um, and making sure that you can optimize based on the behavior that you've witnessed. Um, obviously surviving you know, the big day or the big month uh, or the big quarter potentially. So whatever it is that you're planning for, um, making sure that you can, um, you can do that and you're prepared for that. Um, plan B, so if everything, everything starts to go awry uh, and your site can't actually handle the load that you're anticipating, what do you do? And lastly, and, and maybe even, um, I won't say most importantly, but very importantly, plan C. So at some point, everything is finite, and you may get into a situation where you have a failure. Um, you shouldn't hide from that. Make sure you know how to fail with style. So, so I'm going to about performance, aka the things that we're not going to talk about in this talk. It was caching. So by default, you want to be caching as much as you can. You know, cache your SQL, cache your PHP, cache your uh, application code. Um, all very important stuff. Also, you want to make sure your, your front end is optimized. So uh, compress your CSS, fix, you know, optimize your images, minimize external requests, you know, all standard talk, stuff we talk about when we talk about performance. <coughs> um, also using GZIP on the back end to, to minimize your, your network overhead is uh, important also. So we're not really going to be talking about this stuff, we'll you know, mention it here and there, uh, but it's not the main focus of our talk. So, so yeah, step one in this process is really to, to make a plan. So it's kind of the, the first great step in any process is to really plan out your process, right? So um, with performance in general, though, you want to start early. So, you know, one of the reasons we're bringing this information to you guys, we've been doing this for six or seven years now. We used to think starting early was a month or two, kind of before the, before the event that we were preparing for. Uh, but what you find is, uh, depending on your hosting and your environment infrastructure, you might really need a lot more time than that. So if you, if you need to maybe procure new hardware, get on dedicated racks within your hosting environment, um, make sure that you at least start three or four months early. Um, and depending on the change of the load, you might want to even start earlier than that. Um, secondly, you know, work with your clients to determine uh, your goals and your key metrics. So assuming that your clients do not have infinite budget, um, and if they do have infinite budget, please talk to me after this, but assuming they don't, um, make sure that you, you sit down and you talk about your goals and key metrics of what you want to support. So this could be number of concurrent users, this could be uh, the number of checkouts that you want to be able to support per hour, per day. Um, at some point, you are going to hit a maximum and you need to kind of realize what that is and make sure that that's okay and it's within, your, within the targets that you set. Um, third, make sure you determine a budget. Um, so scaling and having uh, being able to ramp an environment up can get very expensive uh, very quickly. Uh, make sure that you're aware with your client kind of what your spend is going to be and how you want to direct it. Uh, fourth bullet here I think is extremely important and a lot of clients don't uh, realize this so I really want to highlight it. Um, when you think about a site, especially during a high period of load, um, we like to think of it in three different ways. One is you have capacity. So to think about that as like the number of users that you can support. Um, Secondly, you have site speed. So most simply, think about that as how fast your pages can load, how quickly you can move through a process or maybe a checkout process. And then lastly, you have availability, just like uptime of your site, um, how resilient it is, how long it can stay online. 
What people don't realize is that there might be some trade-offs between these. We've ran into many situations during the years where uh, speed can have an impact on uh, capacity. So you might take an action that says, hey, I'm going to make this thing, this action happen a lot faster. But you know what? It has an impact on my CPU, and now I'm not able to support the number of concurrent users I was able to support before. So determining kind of key metrics for each of those and even prioritizing um, what's most important will help you uh, correctly allocate your budget. Uh, next, beware of marketing's calendar. So if you're working potentially with your IT department or with a tech group, um, make sure you understand what marketing is doing. So we've had occasions where we're preparing so much for the holidays and we're doing all of this work in mid-June, then all of a sudden marketing runs a national Groupon and forgot to tell our team about it or forgot to tell IT about it. So that can have a big impact. So make sure that you're talking kind of across departments within the organization. Uh, train your content editor. So I'll tell you what, there's nothing more depressing than spending months trying to get the homepage load to in you know sub half second uh, times and then seeing that uh, you know some new hire on the content team accidentally uploaded a 10 meg image and everything went to hell. So make sure that uh, the people who actually have access to manage your site understand what you're trying to achieve and understand the limits. Um, work with your clients to define you know the different user behaviors that you're going to be optimizing for on your site. Uh, create a list of known bottlenecks across your infrastructure and across your environment and know what alternatives you can take in case one of those bottlenecks becomes a problem. So define that up front. Um, getting down towards the end here, so how will you scale and under what conditions will you scale? Um, so depending on your user behavior and depending on what's actually happening on your site at the time, you might you know, decide that actually the scaling needs to happen on your application servers, or maybe the scaling needs to happen within your cache layer. Um, so knowing how to identify that and having a plan uh, to modify your site is extremely important. And then uh, plan C, we'll talk about that a little bit more towards the end of the presentation, but the point here is to make sure that even up front in this process, talk to your client about what might happen if you get into a situation where you can't adequately handle the load of your site um, in, that, in that heat of battle, when you get to the point, there may be very little that uh, you can do to actually support your users. So you need to talk about you know, different strategies and still how to keep that user behavior crisp and clean, protect the integrity of your brand. All right, so now that you have a plan, let's uh, turn to what you're using to test on your site. So the first thing that you really should focus on is critical path. So if you're in the e-commerce shop, it's going to be adding to cart, checking out, going through that process. Um, if, you know, also logging users, especially with a pull where it's not necessarily going to be cached, you know, test a, a logging user browsing the site and checking out, re adding to a wish list. If you're just a content site, you know, you can have them browse around um, and hit different pages at random. Uh, you also want to hit custom build pages. This also gets back into knowing your system. So knowing how different pages in your site are built and then understanding which ones might be a risk for uh, you know, custom code for going to arrive. So for example, custom product configurations. If you configure a product through a very unique system, you might add a bunch of stuff to the product you're not aware of, so you really want to test that as you're going along. Also, any intense processes that happen behind the scenes or on the front end. So, if you have a migration running every hour, you want to be aware of that and see how it behaves while it's under water, while the rest of the site is under load. Um, also, searching large data sets. If you have a lot of content that people search very often, that's something you want to test and be aware of and make sure um, you know, all that is behaving correctly. So how many of you guys voted last week um, for the primary? So testing is just like voting in Chicago. You want to test early and test often. <laughs> <laughs> so um, getting into some of the tools we use, uh, the first one we're going to talk about is JReader. How many of you guys used JReader before? It's a really great tool for simulating user behavior. So you give it a list of tasks that you want it to hit, and it'll go through, act like a user. It can make post requests and get requests and any kind of request you want. Um, so this is an example of one of our JReader tests. It's going to check out, adding the cart, browsing around a little bit. It allows us to see how 
an actual user would behave uh, if they were browsing the site. And I'll also load all the CSS and JavaScript, or you can tell it not to, depending on your situation. I'll also make Ajax requests for you if you program it to. Um, so some key things to know about JMeter. Slide. Um, you want to make sure your throughput is accurate. So one of the issues you we ran into with JMeter is we set up this test, ran it under 100 users, and the users were generating about 1,000 requests a minute because our test wasn't configured to, to have any wait period. So you can go through Google Analytics and see what the average time on a page is for a user, and then actually program JMeter to, to mimic that wait time. So we can use uh, different Plug or different parts of the system to I mean like a bell curve of how long you usually wait on a page. Um, also, you want to use wrap up time. So, if you're running an hour long test, maybe have your wrap up period be 30 minutes. So, it'll gradually wrap up to 10,000 user tests. That way, if your site breaks at 9,000 users, you can zoom into that time period and have a more accurate result and see what's really going on behind the scenes. There's also a lot of really cool features uh, that JMeter has, like random variables. You can have a, add a random number of products to the cart. You can also parse the result of, of one of your requests and pull out different links. So one of my tests has just a random browsing scenario where, where it will load a page, grab a random link in that page, and then go to that link and repeat that process throughout the test. It's a really cool tool that you can take advantage of a lot of different parts to it. Um, there's also this thing behind the scenes where you can define variables within, within a config file and tweak those as you update the test. So when you run a JMeter test, if you're simulating 100 users on your local laptop, your laptop's not going to do very well. So you can use a cloud service like BlazeMeter, which is you know JMeter in the cloud. It'll launch an AWS instance for you. And you'll be able to simulate you know, 10,000, even a million users on this cloud infrastructure. And those variables give you an easy way to adjust how many users you want to use or how long each user should wait between each request. So a lot of really great parts to it. So while your JMeter test is running, you want to have some kind of analytics in the background. So do any of you guys use New Relic? New Relic is probably one of the most amazing pieces of software I've ever used. Uh, it gives you a glimpse into how your application is behaving, everything from the application code for SQL to external requests. Um, so this is an example of one of the tests we ran. As, as you can see towards the end here, we get a huge wrap up and that's MySQL time. So we can dive into that MySQL wrap up and see what was happening within each request to figure out why you know, there was a wrap up in MySQL. If you look at some of the queries that executed and really get a holistic view of what's going on in our system. So they also give you these traces, like a high level overview of what happens in the request. So it'll tell us, you know, it spent five seconds waiting for UPS to return a response for a shipping rate. Or you know, it spent half a, half a millisecond waiting for Redis to return a cache result. So really great insight into your application. Probably one of the best tools I've ever used. Don't get paid to say that. <laughs> Some other really cool tools that we use. Um, XHProc is a really good profiler. We had a situation where our client site was taking a long time to load really every page. And after running XHProc, we found out that their menu function, like to generate the menu was being called recursively and not caching itself. So every page loader had to load an entire menu from the custom module they had. So we were able to get a, a view into what was going on within the actual application code with the uh, XH product. And Blackfire allows you to do this through an online interface. It'll uh, take profiles of different requests at random that you can dive into and see how actual users are, are behaving within your site. And that horribly performing site, by the way, we did not build it, but we do support it. <laughs> so that happens, that happens quite a bit because we do have a pretty large support organization. If you want to hear more about 
supporting uh, sites like that and how you can do that with a project-based team. Chris Rooney will be speaking on that uh, this afternoon, so keep an eye out for that. LeanDem is also a really good test for some of those things we talked about in the first couple of slides about some of the givens about performance, so it'll check your CSS aggregation and compression, and it'll check how your images are optimized, things like that. So it's a good, you know, one off glimpse to see how your site is performing to make sure, you know, marketing is giving up a little time to give it to your homepage. Um, Recona tools. So have you guys heard of Recona? They're basically a, a fork of MySQL, um, and they they have a, a lot of really amazing tools that you can use with their software. Um, so they have tools that can give you insight into different SQL queries and see how they're performing. It'll, it'll actually give you the query plan and allow you to, bug, to debug on a low level what's going on within each query and what kind of bottlenecks you might have. Another one is a native monitoring interfaces. And you might not normally think about this, but uh, for one of our sites, we had a load balancer. And we were able to bug our hosting company about that they just gave us access to the load balancer to see all the different metrics. So you can see things like CPU use around the actual load balancer and the network performance and pass through of, of it and see you know, if there were any bottlenecks within our load balancer to see and we maybe we need a bigger load balancer or firewall to handle all our traffic. So it's a place that shouldn't really be ignored. <coughs> All right, so now that you have all your tests and all your data, um, identify the problems and fix them. So there's like three or four different areas within this. So first, one you all hit is server utilization. Probably the most common, you know, get 100% CPU usage, 100% RAM usage. Uh, first thing you might try is making a larger server, so scaling vertically within one server. Um, then you might realize, hey, maybe I have too much stuff on the server. So you're running, you know, Apache, MySQL, Redis, all this stuff within one server is fighting over RAM, it's fighting over CPU, so you can separate it out into multiple servers. Um, and then you can scale those servers vertically, or horizontally, sorry, if it's not enough to separate them. So maybe you run multiple application servers, maybe you run multiple SQL servers. Um, so scaling horizontally is also a really good option that we use a lot. Another thing to look at is uh, using a better caching system. So the default Drupal cache might not be, you know, the best. It uses a MySQL backend. You could configure it to use memcache or Redis. So if that becomes a bottleneck, always look at alternatives to caching. Also, if you're scaling horizontally, you want all those uh, servers to use the same cache, so using a centralized cache server like Redis um, on, its own, on its own virtual machine is a good option. And then you could try Varnish. Um, with Varnish, we were able to, to cut the number of application servers we needed in half, but there was a lot of setup time to it. Um, you could use you know, some of the Varnish templates for configuring the server, but sometimes your application might have different profiles that you need to, to customize to fit your needs. So we spent probably six months you know, customizing our Varnish config, listening to user feedback for different errors that popped up. We had one error where randomly, probably once or twice a day, a user wouldn't be able to log in. They would enter their password and nothing would happen. And then you would pay them to ask to replicate. And then we finally traced it down to uh, a Varnish configuration issue, just some logic that was overriding the session data within like a very small subset of people. So a lot of pain setting up Varnish, but there's also a lot of tools out there to kind of help you speed up that process. <coughs> so this is a diagram of one of our networks. We have our firewall load balancer and then 50 web servers. And also supporting those web servers, we have cache, SQL, and NFS. Our NFS server um, feeds all the code to our, our 50 web servers, but we don't have to manage you know, modifying code on all 50 of those. So we have a as location for all of our code and SQL data. But this brings up a really interesting problem of network usage. So network usage isn't that common, but it's probably more deadly because when it pops up, you don't really think, you know, the first thing you think of isn't network usage. You're usually looking at application layer stuff, 
trying to figure out why this is actually keeping flowing. And then you realize, hey, maybe it's the network bandwidth. So some of the, our hosting providers limit your network bandwidth per server. So if you have an NFS server that's using a lot of bandwidth to feed all your files, it could run on the bandwidth, then you know you don't really know that that's happening unless you look into it and really understand it. And I think you'll find that when you get into extreme situations, all hosting providers actually limit the bandwidth less than what the network adapter can support. So AWS, Rackspace, and then you know I'm sure uh, Acquia, Pantheon, all those have limits for how much bandwidth both internally and externally can be saturated before it stops serving traffic. Um, those limits are documented, but not necessarily like in your face on all the marketing materials. So just kind of be aware of that, because uh, it is it was super tricky for us to track down the first time. That yeah. We never thought that kind of two servers sitting within the same cloud hosting environment uh, would actually be able to saturate the channel between them, and then performance would degrade. So as Matt said, we spent a lot of time in the application. We spent a lot of time at different layers, but really thought kind of our bandwidth was infinite, and that wasn't the case. So one of the things that caused us to use a lot of uh, bandwidth with internal release was um, PHP wasn't caching the, the outcast correctly, so it wasn't caching the application layer on the server. Um, so we found a misconfiguration of a PHP file and fix that, and it helped alleviate a lot of the network problems we were facing, so that's something to be aware of. And in that case, we were really monitoring our caching and seeing you know, how opcatch was behaving, how Redis was behaving, and what kind of data was flowing between the servers so that we could really narrow down where the source of the problem might be. Um, if, you, if you're doing any kind of like external request to a CRM or anything on checkout, maybe you can you know, pause that system during a high period of traffic and sync it up later after the traffic is back down. So different you know, parts of your system you really need to be aware of. Um, and if you need to offload your CSS JavaScript, so CDN and your images, it'll cut down on a lot of the, the bandwidth going back and forth. <laughs> Another really cool area, probably one of my favorites, is uh, SQL overhead. So your SQL server you know, starts using all its RAM, all its CPU, it's a really insane area of study that you can literally spend the whole career on. People do, they're called DBAs. They're really smart. Um, and it's a really cool thing to learn about. So one of the things we saw within one of our applications was that uh, poor table design really faltered under load. It was fine, you know, for the average traffic, but then once we had a huge load on our server, you know, the table got overloaded, our SQL got overloaded, and we had to figure out what was going on. And it ended up being because of a very narrow table with a lot of data in it. So, you know, that's fine if you don't have a ton of data in it, and it's just searching one-off, you know, values. But if you have a million records and it's trying to search through and it's not indexed properly, that might not show up until the rest of your system is under load as well. Um, so if you do have a situation like that, you can try using an external uh, database system like Solar is really good. We have search API integration with Drupal, so if you have a lot of data that you need to search through, you can put it into Solar and search through it a lot more efficiently. Um, you can try master-slave configurations. We, we have run into issues with this where data being out of sync, especially within an e-commerce system where Checkouts are happening just continuously, and if you're writing to one server and then immediately reading to another, there might be some lag time there that causes a bad experience or some issues within your site. Yeah. But definitely good stuff to look into and, and try and figure out and, and work. And in our situation, we didn't necessarily need it. Our, our SQL server was able to support the load that we wanted, so we just decided not to go with that configuration. Yeah, believe it or not, even though MySQL replication on a local network is extremely fast, um, during multiple concurrent checkouts, you can get into situations where uh, you write and then you go to read from the read server pretty instantaneously, and some of those requests uh, haven't been fully synced to the read server yet. So just be kind of aware of that as well if you get into those situations to make sure to test a configuration like that under load. Um, you can also work with your hosting provider to try to get those um, 
VMs closer together, potentially on the same machine, um, so that you can lower some of that network latency, because in those pretty extreme examples, it can make a difference. Um, and if you have a complex database like Drupal, where it has um, a table per field, or if you have something like Magento, where it's very abstracted, it can be hard to come up with solutions for a complex database like that. So we were, the, you know, there could be a rabbit hole that you dive down. When you're dealing with SQL that you might not need to, and you can communicate with the client that you have limits on your server, and you need to know those limits, communicate with them, and you know, have plans in place for it if they fall over. So in one situation, we were only able to hit about 100 checkouts per minute without within the site, and you know, we could have spent another 80 hours investigating why that was, and optimizing the database, and trying to, you know put things in different places to get it to work better, communicated with the client, decided that if they hit 100 checkouts per minute, it was a good day, and it wasn't an issue. So you know, really being aware of your system and communicating with the client throughout this entire process is important. So step five, we're done. Cool, see you guys. <laughs> so, um, go back to step three, do it again, and just do it forever until you figure it all out. <laughs> So, you know, one thing that's really important that we realize in this process, we do, we've spent a lot of time over the last few years automating a lot of the things that we've talked about. Um, but, you know, each client can be a little bit different, each environment and kind of use case can be a little bit different. So, you know, while automation is, is great to have, um, you know, there are sometimes, especially when you're getting into the heat of battle, where you can't really rely on just kind of one use case for automation to solve all of your problems. So there's really nothing that beats kind of having you know good documentation on hand, um, you know some some checklists to work through and processes documented. So a few of those things that uh, you guys should all be thinking through is uh, one, just have you know have a uh, a plan together for how you're going to conduct and prepare a load test. Uh, if you do have a large environment and potentially a small client that's operating that. You can't always afford to set up a, a full mirror of that environment because you may have you know, dedicated hardware um, that you use for supporting that. So in that case, believe it or not, sometimes it does make sense to load test production. Um, now how you do that might, might vary from client to client. Maybe you do that after hours uh, or on weekends where you kind of figure out a, a, a time where it's not peak. Um, but when you're conducting a load test, there are steps that you need to take to both not only execute, but then to kind of reset um, changes to that environment after the test takes place. So make sure that you have kind of your process and where that's going to be tested, uh, documented. Secondly, for each resource in your environment, we talked about kind of creating a list of potential bottlenecks earlier in the presentation. Um, make sure you have a plan in place for if one of those bottlenecks actually occurs, um, the steps that you can take to scale that resource. Um, or say, for instance, you know, in the case of having you know, potentially like a dedicated load balancer or a pair of load balancers in your environment, um, when you're really in that, again, kind of that heat of battle situation, you may not be able to do much to actually scale those devices because you know, you're not going to be able to get an engineer into your cabinet to swap out your, your Cisco devices, your ASAs, your F5s, um, right in the middle of one of these issues. So kind of know where the limit is, make sure you know if you can scale it, how to scale it. Um, Thirdly, just kind of writing down common issues that you've seen across clients and across environments and having documented steps to, uh, to troubleshoot those things. So tracking that in, you know, in JIRA or any of your ticketing systems and just kind of flagging those. It's like, hey, here's issues that, you know, here's kind of a knowledge repository of common issues we see under load. is extremely helpful for you know, development teams that are working across multiple sites because Believe it or not, once you identify an issue on one site, you're pretty likely to see it on, a, on another client further down the road. Um, and lastly, make sure that you, you, you keep a repository, uh, you know, whether it be in, in Git or elsewhere, just make sure that you know kind of what your optimized system configurations are for each client. And keep in mind that you may have a config that you apply during a promotional period and other configs that you apply uh, during just kind of normal periods of site maintenance. Um, make sure that you can track those and easily switch between them. So what do you do if you hit your maximum load, right? So if you want to have stuff to, to fail over, you want to know what those limits are, 
and adjust before you even hit them. So if you see the traffic is you know increasing, you might want to put some system in place. Or if you're expecting larger than you know that you can handle, have some system predefined for uh, how to deal with that. So something we've done in the past is for flash shells, you just have a static site that checks out with PayPal. Uh, all on the CDN so that we don't have to hit our servers and overload them during this period. And we know that we won't be able to support it no matter what we do within our budget. So having a, a static site is a good option for that. Also, um, offloading stuff to the CDN um, and having third, third party integrations uh, that are backups. So if, you know, if you're doing, if you have a lot of load during a common season like the holiday season, you gotta figure that there's a million other people out there that are experiencing the same thing. Maybe your payment gateway is overloaded as well. So if that goes down, you wanna have an alternate um, during that time period just in case you know something unexpected happens like that. Yeah, that's very, that actually happened this year. I don't know if you guys remember, but PayPal is either on Black Friday or Cyber Monday had uh, a, a period of degraded service. I won't say it was a full outage because it didn't affect all clients, but I think like a request and response from them, which is usually you know, supposed to be uh, definitely sub-second, was taking about three seconds or so, and that has a huge impact right, on, on how long it's taking people to get through your checkout process. And then what happens is as people start to back up, that process becomes more intense, and then all of your server utilization shoots up. So being able to switch, you know, take out PayPal and put in uh, authorized.net or put in kind of an alternate payment uh, provider, you know, accounting is going to not be real happy with you. Um, but at the end of the day, it's good to have alternates so you can kind of bypass that process and keep traffic moving. So plan C, so what happens if all of your, you know, best laid plans don't really come to fruition? Um, you know, there is, there is always a point, no matter how well you plan this stuff, no matter how thoroughly you build your environment, resources are always, you know, finite from an engineering perspective, and there's a potential for failure. So, if you're going to fail, you should have this conversation up front, right? I mean, it, all clients should know that there's a possibility of this, and if you have a plan of what you're going to do in this scenario, it's going to make your customers happier, and it's going to protect the, your brand integrity. So. First of all, you know, determine how to handle traffic that can't be supported. So, you know, in Apache or in Nginx or at the web server level, you can limit this. Um, but through your testing, you should be able to determine kind of how many users each of your application servers can support. And then once you hit that max or hit that peak, uh, you can proactively take that traffic and maybe direct them away to a, a static page on the CDN. You know, whoops, we have too much load or maybe some type of uh, promotional page. Um, Next, you know, pre-plan for a customer uh, communication strategy for when you actually do have outages uh, or you do see that your kind of your load balancer overflow page, your whoops page is being hit. Um, so that could be a couple of things. One is when you're in that period, you know, make sure to use social media channels to communicate out to all of your, all the people who are trying to get to your site, hey, you know, we're under high amount of traffic, thanks for the support, um, you know, maybe try back in an hour if you're having issues checking out. Um, you know, also thinking about sending an email, uh, you know, a mass response, um, you know, potentially a day after the outage or during the outage, letting your customers know the situation and offering them some incentive to come back to the site, um, whether that be a coupon code or a promotional code or something that's kind of personalized to them and their site experience. Um, roughly about three years ago, we had a situation during one of the most important days for one of our clients where this exact thing occurred. Um, they went down for maybe about an hour, an hour and a half during one of the most important periods. And you know, for a little while that looked, that looked really bad. Um, but we worked with them on creating a communication to send out to their customer base um, with a promotional code. Um, and what happened is the next day they had record sales. And when you compared kind of the two days together, um, they had hit more sales than they had anticipated <coughs> having or really had kind of blown past their goal. And it was, even their business had thought, um, internally it was discussed, hey, you know, I wonder if we hadn't had that outage, we hadn't had that opportunity to communicate to our customers, if we really would have hit the sales that we had hit before. So, you know, not saying, not saying to introduce a failure for that type of thing, but, you know, if you play it right, it can, it can have its benefits, it can build a lot of client uh, trust in your organization. 
And lastly, you know, don't, don't freak out, try to stay calm and cool. Uh, think beforehand, if you do get into an outage situation, how can you capture data? So even if you are offloading people offsite and throwing them out to a CDN or to a, like a third party kind of static site that's gonna absorb all your traffic, um, make sure that you get your tracking tools installed on all of those different applications. Make sure that all that data is coming back. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna provide you better estimates for the next time you get into this situation. Now, hey, if you plan for you know, 50,000 users and you saw that 75,000 uniques were hitting your overflow page, guess what, you missed your estimates. Um, but at least you have that data now, you have that data so you don't get into that situation again and you can you know, justify potentially further budget uh, in the next year to expand your environment even further. So, I've got two quick slides here, but these are really my favorite of the presentation because these are some surprises and gotchas that we've ran into as an organization that we want to share with you guys because we thought these were not super obvious things when you're, when you're in this situation and they're, they're kind of interesting to, to know about. So one, if you are going to test production, that's great. We actually you know, recommend doing some load testing there just so you know exactly how that environment behaves. Um, we got very aggressive with that one year and we did so much testing that we kind of forgot that we were filling up all the logs. <laughs> And the database was, um, some of the tables were becoming overloaded with so much of the, the test data that we were pumping into the system. and actually had an adverse effect on performance the next day. So clear some of that stuff out. Uh, synthetics tests. Um, you're going to try to replicate human behavior, but humans can be kind of funny sometimes. And if, you know, if your client, uh, say, gets a promotional spot on the Today Show, um, you know, when are they actually going to hit the site? You know, is it... Is it when you know Matt Lauer really talks up their brand, or is it uh, you know when they show the URL at the bottom of the screen? And is it going to ramp up over ten minutes or five minutes? Some of that stuff's really hard to predict, um, and you have to be ready for that. Um, version upgrades, so whether this be to core, to modules, or just you know the client wants to make some small uh, CSS changes or add a new kind of custom page or custom layout to their site. Just keep in mind that those actually do matter. Your client will try to say, oh, don't worry about it. You know, let's just push out this quick change. Um, but if you spent months kind of preparing for a high performing site, you need to really test uh, every change that's being deployed. Um, last one on this slide. So this is kind of an interesting situation that happened to us last year, actually. So we had a configuration that we'd worked so hard on. We had optimized for uh, a very aggressive scenario. Um, but we were about three weeks out from that, from that period of time actually occurring. And what we found is an optimized config that was geared for many, many users uh, actually did very poorly at supporting the site's regular load. And a lot of that was because the caches couldn't stay warm enough because traffic wasn't uh, turning over and we weren't having enough people on the site. Um, so we kind of had to revert back, hold that config, and then push it out closer to the performance period. Really weird, you wouldn't expect it. Um, but the site actually performed hot and better with much larger traffic. Um, a few more, so you know, all the, all the hosting providers have some solution for auto-scaling. Um, auto-scaling can work really well in certain situations if you want to spin up more app servers or something like that. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not always great with every situation, so your mileage might vary a little bit there. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, next, do not ex uh, execute any impactful processes during periods of high load. So, spent several months with a client, again, same situation. Um, got to that big day, we were doing awesome, and then all of a sudden their sales team was like, man, it'd really be interesting to pull like sales reports for the last three months. And they didn't have a custom reporting database, so they were hitting production and running all these complex queries. Site starts to tank, and then we see, you know, we see all these things coming through a new relic. That someone's trying to pull like their quarterly reports on the day of their biggest sales period. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> uh, next, you know, disable non-critical integrations. Uh, Matt talked a little bit about that earlier, but if you're calling out to a service or you're calling out somewhere internally, that doesn't need to happen that day. Just go ahead and turn it off. Um, Noisy neighbors. So I don't know. In my experience, anytime working with engineers, we get into a, a period of time. Everyone's stressed out. The site's going crazy. We're getting more traffic than what we expected. Uh, everyone says, "Well, why isn't this performing right?" You know what? We're on VMs. Maybe it is like noisy neighbors and the environment, and somebody else is impacting us. So far, that's never been the issue that we've ever actually been able to track down. It's always been something kind of within our own environment or behavior on our own site. Um, that's been our experience, so I wouldn't jump to that conclusion so quickly just because you're on cloud, uh, cloud infrastructure. Um, lastly, don't forget about security through this process. So there's some trade-offs 
sometimes between performance and security. Um, so make sure that when you when you finish kind of your uh, scaling and your performance optimization optimization of your environment, uh, that you go back and you run the appropriate penetration tests, vulnerability tests. Um, make sure that you haven't done something that's going to um, you know hurt yourself in the long term just to eke out a little bit more performance and capacity. So I think that. Basically gets us to the end of what we wanted to cover today. We want to leave time for you guys at the end for any uh, questions for us or about the material. So feel free to. Uh, when you load balance Drupal, is the session stored in the database so it's server agnostic, or is uh, the user session within memory in that specific server? We've done it a couple different ways, so three different ways really. So we've tried, um, you know, database layer. I think that's what we ended up sticking with. We've also tried using files uh, on our, on the local server for session storage, um, and that then you have to configure your load balancer to have sticky sessions. So if they're going to one server, they have to go back to it, and it's kind of raised some issues in the past. So we, we prefer a centralized location for session storage. So um, I think at one point we had them in Redis. Yeah. And then found out that Redis wasn't performing it very well with their certain loads, so we put them back in the database. So I think ultimately we have them in the database. Yeah, and you have to kind of keep in mind if you do try to put all of your sessions into, uh, you know, something that's volatile, you know, like you know memory or something, where if you reboot a machine, you could potentially lose your session state. So yeah, that's kind of a compelling reason to, you know, have them stored within files or stored within the database. But you know, kind of the you know, one of the whole themes of the presentation is um, that there can be a lot of right answers depending on the situation, but you really kind of have to test each one to know how it's going to perform uh, under the specific case you're planning for. So for Drupal site that's load balanced, are you, to handle the files, like the images and documents that users upload, are you putting that on the NFS? Yeah, so all that stuff is in the NFS and we just have our whole web group mounted. It's uh, a single, or, it's just a single place for all the... Yeah, so then if you want to update code, you just have to update it in one place. Oh. Don't have to go to all the other server servers to, to get that oh. through. And that's where caching comes into play a lot, because you know, if you have that network cache between your NFS and your app servers, that can get overloaded very easily if you have large, large images. So you don't really have any, like, um, you know, custom caching on the app server. We mostly rely on the Linux, uh, you know, just file system caching to help alleviate a lot of that network traffic. And also have cache for, like, local caching. So the follow-up question, if you don't mind. Um, so in our organization, we didn't do the NFS route. We did instead as we used Varnish mm -hmm. to force all authenticated users to go to a particular server and that's where the files are. Right. Do you think that's a terrible idea? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean if I would, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's working so far. Uh, so, how are you keeping all the individual servers in the sync? Do you do like an R sync between There's an L sync. And, and okay. See that was the problem is it's I guess currently L sync's only monodirectional, right? So right. so we actually uh, kind of rolled it out as a pilot, yes. and we noticed, oh yeah, images are missing randomly. Right. And then we're yeah. like, oh yeah, this right. is stupid. <laughs> we actually have that same problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why we didn't have that okay. problem. <laughs> Yeah, and, and two, you know, we don't we didn't talk a lot in this presentation about like specific performance things. That's kind of the uh, area that we weren't covering super heavily. But um, you know, we should probably play up the fact to use the CDN more. You know, okay. so if any of those static assets, um, you want to get those off of your network. There's no reason to be paying any hosting provider to host all of your images and deliver those out. Get those out to the edge. Get those off of your devices, and then that'll free up uh, a lot of your resources. It's, it's been a few years since I've used New Relic, and uh, back then when I was using it, we never used it on the production server just because it added extra performance hit. Mm -hmm. Is that is that been your experience to use it on the production um, server? Um, we haven't really we haven't really tested that too much, but we haven't noticed really any okay. any issues with that. It, it does add some overhead, but I think that the benefit of having like that monitoring in place kind of outweighs the performance that we take with it. Yeah, I don't. I can't remember. We've had other people ask us the similar question before, and I can't recall any situation where, you know, we were going through kind of the troubleshooting process and said, "Oh, it's 
it's new relic that's kind of having that impact. So the amount of memory, like Matt said, the amount of memory and system resources it takes is uh, a very valuable trade off. And we do, we do, we deploy it out to every production app server because it also helps us know. You know, occasionally when you're spinning up and tearing down um, multiple servers, you know, sometimes just like weird things happen. Um, you know, within potentially a, a config or a deployment or a server doesn't spin up right and just needs to be blown away. And it's really nice kind of having you really like to be able to do how that works is you'll see kind of one application monitoring graph and then you can use it to drill down into any of the specific servers it's, that it's installed on. We have had issues with like centralized logging on each mm -hmm. server and figuring to turn that off and work in our image so that you know some of you have all this traffic from, from our logging system that's aggregating all of our logs. So yeah, there are some cases where like external services like that will overload you, but with New Relic, I don't think it's that much of an issue. Cool. So just to jump to the conclusion real quick. You really want to know your environment. <laughs> That's something where I, I think is the most important part of this talk is that you really need to understand your environment. You need to know every little corner of it and spend that time getting to know the different processes and where and how everything communicates so that if something does break, you know exactly where to look and you have that understanding of you know what it's capable of. Yeah, and lastly, you know, we talked about this a couple times throughout the presentation, but you know, start early, engage your stakeholders in performance planning, uh, know what your goals are, know what your user paths are that you need to be able to support, uh, define your budget, make sure that you get buy-in from the business, and that way if you do get into one of these situations or if you do have to, to go into battle or start fighting fires for the site, um, you can always kind of tie that back to the plan and make adjustments uh, for the next promotional period. So, cool. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for coming. And uh, make sure to join the sprint tomorrow, and then we do have a crazy feedback link there. Seventeen two five eight, I guess, is our ID number. So, thank you again.